it's you. Um, so I think okay. I did both of the parent traps, honestly. I have no clue. If Rachel leaves this in once again, we're debating who starts the podcast. <laughs> well, welcome back. My name is Hannah. And I'm Rachel. And this is the You Talking to Me podcast. Today, we are starting our month of originals versus remakes. And the first film... No, no we are not starting it. I am lying to you. This is our second <laughs> film that we're doing. Uh, you know, sometimes Rachel and I struggle with what comes when and who says what. But you know what? That's just real life. But on the plus side, this is the final film and podcast that we have to re-record. So hopefully we are better organized after this. But if we're being honest, we're not going to be. <laughs> you would think we'd be more organized because we do have spreadsheets, like literal spreadsheets. Okay. Um, but, you know, we're just rolling through life. But this film that we're talking about or movie whatever you want to call it is the original lady and the tramp i'll give you a little recap or as rachel calls it a synopsis and here we go lady and the tramp is about a dog named lady who gets brought into darling and jim deer's life she lives very comfortably until darling gets pregnant which is when the dynamic has shifted Darling and Jim Deer pay less attention to Lady, but when the baby is born, they let Lady protect him. One day, Darling and Jim Deer go on a trip, and Lady escapes from Aunt Sarah, who comes to stay with Lady and the baby. Lady goes around with a stray dog, Tramp, she has met, and she ends up getting brought into a pound. Dun, dun, dun. When she is rescued, her friends, Trusty and Jacques, come to see how she is doing. And when Tramp shows up, they say they won't get rid of him. Lady has to stay outside now, and a rack gets inside the house. But Tramp comes to the rescue and kills it before it gets the baby. Aunt Sarah thinks he is just a wild dog in the house and calls the pound. Trusty and Jacques go after the vehicle to make it stop. Darling and Jim Deere save Tramp and welcome him into their family. And Tramp and Lady have babies and live a happy life. Hannah, what were your overall thoughts on this film? Because I, as a child, have determined this film to be my number one favorite Disney, Disney movie. And... I'm just going to leave it at that for now. I want to know what your thoughts were. Well, since Rachel has already previously stated that this is a re-recording of this, my feelings have settled a little bit, okay? But overall, I didn't like it. I would not watch it again. I wouldn't recommend it to someone. Uh, at the beginning, they actually have to have a warning about the harmful language towards certain cultures in it. And when something starts with that... Um, I don't know. And then that intro song, I know you love it, but if I never had to hear that again, it would be too soon. <laughs> I really do like it. I think it's really pretty. I think the like scenes and stuff that they have with the credits just flow very well together. And I think it's a beautiful song. I don't know what the words are to it at all. So I'm just going to like ignore that part but I think it sounds very pretty so <laughs> I do agree that anything that starts off with a disclaimer though really makes it hard to just go through the whole movie and enjoy it without waiting to see where the disclaimer like is for like what the disclaimer is for so that I could totally see being like, whoops, <laughs> maybe this shouldn't be my favorite Disney movie anymore. But as a kid, you definitely don't understand any of these like cultural references that are very inaccurate and stereotypical. But now like rewatching it, I haven't seen it in a very long time. Rewatching it, it's definitely cringe city and you're just shocked how people like can get away with this uh true and just so you know i just looked up the intro song lyrics the lyrics are fine they're kind of cute but 
I don't know. For me, it's just that person who's saying it. I was like, I could live without that. <laughs> I just sound like I'm just bashing Rachel's favorite movie. Um, I also think that for me, I think since you watched it as a child, your standards are probably different, you know, when you're a kid versus if you watch something when you're older. And the animation style for me just wasn't it. Um, and so I'm thinking that that played a big role in it because of how it was animated versus today's animation. Like when we watch Soul, that's the type of animation I like versus the animation in this. I love the like drawn 2D animation. It takes so long to do though because there are artists that have to draw every single frame to put it together. Like there are other old Disney movies where they just like, yes, it is on purpose at times, but they just like don't finish the backgrounds or it looks like it's drawn in like pencil and they like didn't really finish it that much. I think they were just testing what that would look like because it is so expensive and so time consuming to go such in detail. But this one, I think I have a lot of respect for this type of animation because it does take so long and all of the animators and artists have to like be on the same page about what Lady looks like, what this looks like and stuff like that. But it, it is a type of animation that I really like. And I actually was like, I want them to go back to this kind of animation. But when I found out that it would be way more expensive because of how long it would take, you can't just like do too much like on the computer for it but they do also a way that they got around is they reuse animation for different movies I don't know if a lot of you've seen I've seen it a lot on Facebook where there's a scene of Christopher Robin and a scene of Mowgli from the Jungle Book like walking like up a a rock and they like trip on something like it's the exact same movements just with a different scene and obviously their their bodies like are designed in a way but they reuse like the sequencing so that's another way that they saved some of the time and money but 2d animation is crazy <laughs> so well i definitely respect artists and i think it's cool that they do that i could not imagine having a job where you had to do that much work for something because you know it probably takes days to come up with 30 seconds like I don't know that's a lot of work I just think that I don't know I think I wasn't expecting that animation maybe if I went in with the mindset of it's a 2d animation I would have liked it more does that make sense yeah for sure um I'm just shocked that you really really had never seen this movie because it like was such a big part of my childhood I know a lot of kids our age watched a lot of Disney movies as children because there wasn't a wide range of kids content that was like appropriate or streaming services didn't exist so you really had to own VHSs and whatnot to watch these things because YouTube also was not a big thing so I do know that Disney was like a huge marketing point like for children so I'm just shocked that you didn't see Lady and the Tramp I feel like I said it was huge for me so I think also the nostalgia part is a big part for me on why I love this movie just thinking about it I am willing to look at other Disney movies to see if I have a new favorite but I do like a lot of this film and it honestly, for a while, made Cocker Spaniels my favorite type of dog. But then when I saw what they looked like in real life, I was like, you are not cute like Lady. You are just a weird curly pup. And they're still cute, but not my favorite anymore. Well, I think the fact that you said that it was such a big part of your childhood, that's what I think makes the difference. Like, I have a feeling if I watched the Goofy movie now, I probably would think of it differently than when I than what I thought of it as a kid but for my brother and myself that was a huge part of our childhood we watched that movie all the time I didn't watch a lot of the Disney classics it's more like the Goofy movie or Flubber or a Barbie movie or Mary Kate and Ashley or Eloise at the Plaza that was or Matilda Madeline those were all like the huge movies for me and my life but it wasn't like Cinderella Sleeping Beauty it was none of them I don't even think I've seen half of them. 
Real quick, I will say, out of all those movies, I think a lot of those would still stand today as being good, like if you'd never seen them as a child, because I watched Eloise at Christmas or whatever it's called this Christmas for the first time. I am hooked. I'm in love. Um, let us know if there's other like really cute Christmas movies that are on the same vibe because I'm willing to review them at, oh my god, that's so cute. Hannah's holding up a DVD copy of Eloise at the Plaza. But I am willing to take recommendations if there are other movies that fit that vibe because it's like the human version of a Paddington movie in my mind. Like if you had not seen Paddington, Hannah, go watch it because it gives me Eloise vibes, honestly. Okay, I will watch it sometime and I'll let you know if I if I agree with that statement. Okay, so one thing that I will say that I like slash dislike. So I like, I'll say what I like and then I'll say why I dislike it in this film is I like that all of the dogs have a different personality. They have different characteristics because I feel like you have to treat them like they're humans when creating their characters because... Yes, all animals have different personalities. I'm house sitting for someone who has a bunch of cats and they all are very different. And we literally call one of them a bitch because she eats everyone's food and everything. But I think when like creating a character profile, when I think of like a cat or a dog, I think, yeah, they're hyper or they're, they lick a lot, you know, they're social, that type of stuff. But I'm not thinking like, um, you know, oh, really caring dog who wants to take care of his friends and cares about his feelings so he doesn't bring things up about the past to protect his feelings. I don't think about that because that's a very human trait to us. I like how this movie did give all of them, you know, backgrounds and stories and actual characteristics that you would associate with humans. Now, what I don't like about how they characterize all the separate dogs is that if it was a dog that had like you know Scottish in front of it or English in front of it or if it's a chihuahua they stereotype it towards that country which I didn't notice until well besides the Siamese cat song which is a whole different story from this specific point we will touch on it don't you worry but I didn't notice a lot of it until they get to the pound because yes, you notice the Scottish dog, but I really didn't think it was really that offensive. It probably wasn't very accurate of a accent, but I mean, it was just, he was just talking in the accent or the English bulldog. I'm surprised didn't have an English accent, but it was like this big puffy dog, you know, that had like a gruff voice, but you get to the pound and there's this chihuahua. And they don't just give it a Mexican accent, which one wouldn't have been ideal regardless because, you know, back in the the time that this was made that it wouldn't have been a real Mexican person voicing it. But on top of that, they make a very clear joke of a lot of Hispanic cultures where this Chihuahua has a sister who has like seven names, like seven names long, which is making fun of the fact that people who come from a lot of like Latina cultures have two last names because they take one from their mom and one from their dad combine them and apparently that's hilarious because I've never seen a white person do that oh my gosh like that's just totally not a thing that white people do it's just hilarious when you know Mexicans and and Spanish people do that Oh, oh my gosh so funny like it's so stupid you would And they do that, honestly, in The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, too. And you don't realize that as a kid because it is funny the way he does it. But could you imagine being the guy who plays Esteban and having to do that? Like, I don't know if he thought it was funny or not, but like looking back, you're like, oh, my God, that's like offensive because you're taking a very specific part of this person's culture and making the butt of the joke. That's what I disliked about the way that they portrayed the different characters um personality traits because they made it like a joke if it was a non-white especially um culture that they were talking about right and it did just feel like they were making jokes about other ethnicities or cultures besides white people and probably even like besides the middle class 
or, you know, because they definitely weren't not wealthy. Um, yeah, I, and I would hope to believe that the writers, if they wrote it now, would think differently if it was the same writer because things have progressed and, you know, maybe they just weren't even aware that that could be offensive because, you know, sometimes it is you grow up in a place where you think a certain way because of the way people act around you and talk around you and you just think that that's normal. You genuinely don't think something of it until you're brought to the point where you become aware of a different opinion or a different perspective or see it from the other person's type point of view. So, you know, there's that. I feel like there was another dog in the pound too that was very stereotyped and I can't think of which one it was, but I feel like there was a second one besides the Chihuahua that was just like super stereotyped. Do you remember if there was another one? There was like an Irish greyhound in there, the really tall bluish gray dog. There's also the, the female dog, um, Trixie. She was like a hoe, basically. <laughs> like, like she is this like scandalous dog that sleeps around and she's it's like all it she and the tramp are dogs that appear like womanizers and you know sleeps around and they're portrayed kind of negatively and like they're the ones that are homeless and all that stuff as if like if you're rich and pristine you don't also have the ability to sleep around you know like it's fine that lady is like a one dog, you know, kind of gal. She just wants one man and that's it. But that doesn't mean that the tramp or that Trixie or any other dog can't also, or I mean, even the other dogs that have homes, like they don't have to not want to sleep with other dogs. Like it's really weird talking about it in terms of dogs, but like people, if we just think about it as people, like just because you're like a wealthy, pristine, like, person, or, you know, come from this type of lifestyle doesn't mean that you're not capable of wanting to just, like, not settle down, not have, you know, commitment with one person, and you can go do and hang out with whoever you want, and it doesn't just mean that if you are poor or homeless or come from a bad home that you're going to be the opposite of that, you know? True. You never know what type of person is going to be however they're going to be. I mean, you'll grow to be whoever you're going to be and, you know, just follow whatever you want to do. And that's what you should do. Uh, what was I going to say? The thought left my brain. It has left the stage. <laughs> oh, a fun fact I wanted to say was that the real tramp, there was a real tramp. Like they found a dog for inspiration for Tramp and it was actually a girl dog so that's interesting and then Disney adopted like Walt Disney adopted her and she got to live behind Disneyland as and just like live out her life there I don't know if she lived there forever but while they were creating the film she got to live behind Disneyland so that they could always just watch how she act and like looked in different poses and stuff to use as inspiration as tramp. That's cool because I mean, I think it is very nice that they did adopt a dog and like did save a dog's life in terms of this movie. Um, they did something right because I know that that is a big theme in the remake of the film is adoption so it is nice that you know one they did adopt tramp in this movie that we watched um but it isn't like this big focus of like you should adopt dogs like that isn't a st they're not trying to push any agenda in this film when it comes to adopt don't shop or anything like that because i mean they did buy lady i'm guessing from a pet store or something but then they adopted tramp so I thought, though, that Lady was so freaking cute as a baby, but so annoying. <laughs> I would, like, 
have been so mad. I would understand because she's scared. She's a baby, all this stuff. But I would have been so mad if I had a dog that was whining like that. But I also would be so mad if I saw someone like Jim Deere just like locking her in this room and like not trying to teach her, you know, how to be quiet, not using any like real techniques to train the dog. It seemed like they got the dog and didn't want to do anything about it, but then made it very simple that, oh, if you let her sleep with you, she'll stop whining and not pee in the bed. I would have been so nervous she would have peed in the bed. Me too. I feel like, well, I helped watch my brother's dog when he got the dog because they went on a trip like two days after they got him. So I had him for a week and that was always my thing was just like, oh my gosh, please don't pee on the floor. (laughs) Please don't pee on the floor. But he never did. So, you know, there's that, but I'd never let him in the bed because that'd be a bad idea. I guess we didn't touch on the last thing that we should have touched on with the harmful language towards certain cultures, which is the song, the song people with the Siamese cats. Uh, how, How do we approach this one, Rachel? Well, I'll approach it very honestly. Like we talked about how as a kid, you don't understand, especially a kid like me, very privileged, very white, very middle class, um, grew up in a lot of white schools. Sure, we had some people of color at my school, but in North Dakota, that was not a really big thing until about middle school when uh, we got a lot more kids from the base who kept moving, and we got a lot more, um, the, the Lutheran services were bringing a lot more people in who were refugees and stuff like that, starting in middle school and high school. So the integration of a lot of different cultures was not a big thing. I was not aware of this. Even on TV, there wasn't a lot of it. So when I watched the Lady in the Tramp movie for the first couple times, I thought this song was a bop. I was like, it's so catchy. It has a good tune. But then, as you watch it, (laughs) as an adult who has been educated and understands different things are offensive to people, Um, and should be offensive, honestly, to everybody, because it's not treaded lightly at all when they wrote this song. It is just downright disgusting, like, the types of stereotypes that they threw in this song. So I definitely am not enjoying this movie as much as I did as a kid. Like, like I said, there's still a lot of parts that I really like of this film, and I definitely, um, think the animation and everything is really good but they really miss the mark a lot of times in this film because there was like no need to even pick Siamese cats like why was that the kind that they picked like they could have picked any cats and written literally any other song about them destroying a house Like, it had nothing to do with what they were doing, even, you know? Not that I can think of any Siamese stereotypes in terms of, like, the people in general. Like, I don't know of them as being people who destroy things or whatever. I don't know what they were touching on. I think they just wanted a funny Asian-oriented song that would later very much be offensive. So, I don't know. What What are your opinions of it, Hannah? Oh, I agree. And when you were saying it, the first time you heard it, it was a bob or whatever word you used. I had like a flashback to my childhood. And I feel like, if I'm not mistaken, my music teacher in elementary school was like having us sing this song or we did something with that song. Because I just like all of a sudden saw her sitting at a piano playing this song and singing it. And I'm like, wow, were we taught this song in public schools? I'm not positive, but my brain's telling me that that happened. So that could have happened, which is interesting because you would think by that point, if you're an adult, you would realize that that's not okay. I mean, adults wrote this song, so evidently not. (laughs) Fair point, fair point. I, yeah, there was a lot of problems with it and I don't know I just found it offensive I didn't like it 
obviously, like you said, it has stereotypes in there, but are they true stereotypes? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what? It's just, it's an offensive song. I don't think anyone could say it's not. That's Almost my point. You just don't care about people. But even if you don't care about people, you can still see that this could be harmful. Whether or not you care is another thing. So who knows? I am not that type of person, so I don't know how they would feel, but that's on them. So do you have anything else to touch on with the fact that, you know, that's so offensive? I feel like we've talked about something with your writing before. Yeah, so in film school, we've had, like, many scripts and many conversations about, like, what you should or shouldn't write about or what you can and cannot write about. And there's not a lot of censorship at all at my school, which is very good because a lot of people have a lot of things that they want to talk about. But so in terms of, you know, using offensive language and talking poorly or offensively about another culture, one of the guidelines that we kind of live by is if a character if it comes out of a character's mouth, it's quote unquote okay to have in your script. You know, like obviously I hope no one ever speaks the way like these people write about these cultures in the Lady and the Tramp. But if you have a racist or a homophobe in your script, like that's who that person is. You know, that's how they view life. And so it's okay for them to say it because that's their authentic self. But if you, like, write that person's an N-word, like, in your action slugs, like, while you're typing the script, like, that's coming from you. Like, that's how you view the world. And that's not okay. You know, like, using harmful language in, like, the action parts of your script, which are basically, like, what's not being said, you know, that's a reflection on you as a person. That being said these harmful stereotypes in this movie are not reflections of the characters because this song is it's about two Siamese cats who are Asian themselves by descent using harmful language about like their culture so that is definitely a reflection on the writers themselves same with the chihuahua you know having Mexican stereotypes in his dialogue like that is still a reflection of the writer because I don't truly believe like if these were real people they would honestly like like this song or sing this song or come up with it or say these things so I still don't agree with anything (laughs) about those scenes in this film but I do want to say that it isn't not allowed to talk poorly about other cultures if it's a character in your film or tv show or something who believes that to be true because you don't have to believe it for your character to believe it right and i guess i could see how sometimes you need to make a point with the fact that there are people who are still racist and homophobic you know they think that way and maybe that would help the plot or whatever that you're writing, you know, and help it, the story move along. But I get why it also makes sense that in the action slug or whatever you called it, you don't write that because that's you and what you're thinking. So that makes sense to me. Was there anything else you disliked in the film or anything that you really loved in this movie? Well, in my notes, I have, it didn't like most of it, but like the happy ending. So it's like this, there's like this stupid thing in some shows that I really don't like or movies that I really don't like. And the whole thing, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to watch this ever again. And then in the last five minutes, they change my mind because the ending's cute. And I'm like, why is the ending cute? So I liked the happy ending. I liked that they got to be with each other and that they had their little puppies and it was like Christmas. It was a cute way to end the movie. But I feel like there weren't any other parts that I felt super strongly about, except for I just didn't like Aunt Sarah. I feel like I just need to throw that out there. Aunt Sarah's the worst. <laughs> Did you have any other parts you liked or didn't like? 
the most iconic scene from the movie. If you've never seen the movie, you know about the scene. It's the spaghetti scene with Lady and Tramp at the Italian restaurant. And so they show up. Well, first it's just Tramp who is kind of there. And he actually has this thing where he goes to a bunch of local restaurants or even like some people's houses and they'll feed him like on specific days, which I think is very sweet that they like him enough to actually be like, yeah, sure, here's the steak or here's some pork chops or here's some spaghetti, whatever, or bones, whatever they end up giving him. I think that's so sweet because um, it's a kind gesture, you know? But when he shows up to Tony's restaurant, which by the way, I ate at at Disney World and it was lovely. And they played Lady and the Tramp the whole time in the lobby while you were waiting because it's usually a long wait. They, they, it's just the Tramp who shows up and he's like, oh, I'm going to get um, you some food. But then he sees that he has his little girlfriend or whatever. And they're like, oh, we got to make this special for them and things like that. And so he like, talks to his assistant and the assistant's like I'm gonna get some bones for him and he's like bones no and so he's like no he wants he told me he wants the spaghetti special or whatever and the guy's like dogs don't talk he goes he's the talking to me (laughs) like I thought that was so funny and the guy's like yeah he's talking to you boss oh god like I'm working for a crazy man you know all this really funny stuff so I thought that scene was actually funny too outside of the whole like they're eating spaghetti and they kiss and like it's just a really cute like scene I think it's this is a spoiler for next week's podcast I think it's way cuter in the 2d animation than when they try to do it all with like the real dog cgi'd and stuff just go watch the the new lady and the tramp and you'll understand and you'll get our whole full analysis of that next week but I did actually think it was cute in this version of the film I did think it was cute, too. Um, I don't know if it's realistic, but I think it was cute. Honestly, I'm the type of person where most of that spaghetti scene, what I was concentrated on was the fact that there was clotheslines hanging in this alley and people had clothes hanging on the clotheslines. And I was like, do people really dry their clothes like that? That's what I want to know. That is genuinely where my brain was most of the time. I was barely focused on them eating. That's that's just how my brain works. So now you know. <laughs> I feel like that has to kind of be true because I've seen it in so many movies. I don't know if just one movie did it and then every movie that took place in a city from then on does it. But I do really think that must be a thing, especially this takes place in like, the 40s or something like crazy like that I don't know it was 1955 when they okay. made it yeah it takes place in the 50s where they don't have like a bunch of fancy washers and dryers so they probably did have to hang them up and outside is the best way and in a city that's probably how they had the clothesline set up because you don't have a yard we used to have a clothesline in our backyard at my house but we took it down mostly it was dangerous because there were like nails sticking out of it or screws or something and I don't know why they were there to begin with but I just remember as a kid like hanging on the like bars of it I don't know that was super random and a memory that I didn't really realize I had so well you're welcome that I brought that out of your brain with my random area that I was paying attention to but that's all I have to say about this movie I think is that all you have to say, Rachel? Um, real, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was the scene with the pound, like ignoring all of the racial stuff that we are, and like misogynistic stuff that we already talked about. At the very beginning, they make it like the saddest place on earth. Like they have all these like sounds of like dogs whining and howling and like pans of like, dogs literally crying they did want to go and adopt all those dogs I don't know if they didn't like if they had an agenda to get you to adopt dogs like that would have been the way to do it I think they just tried to make it look sad and depressing because lady was there now and it's like the opposite of who she is but it worked on me I was like all right getting in the car now let's go (laughs) gotta go save every puppy on the planet it reminded me of a Sarah McLaughlin commercial where they show you all like the saddest dogs ever and I'm like why 
why are you doing this to me? Like, Sarah McLaughlin, are you sponsored by Lady and the Tramp, the original? Because it's coming at me with strong feelings. They definitely hit you in the feels. Mm-hmm. Especially when they, like, walk that other dog out because it's going to die. <laughs> Especially because like, yeah. I feel like it was just slightly overcrowded and it made me feel like because Lady was there, they had to kill a dog. You know? Yeah, and then she gets taken out of there, so it's like that dog didn't have to die. Like, give them a minute, okay? Like, one minute. And see if someone shows up or see if she gets out, okay? (laughs) Also, why... She's got a collar on, hello. Yeah. What's the point of her having a collar? No, wait, she didn't have it on that point. It fell off, I thought. Oh, maybe it did. Because I was like, what's the point of having a collar if you don't have your address or, like, phone number or something on it? Or your name, like in a city, like a place like that, I feel like everyone knows everyone. But tell me why the dog catcher cares so damn much about getting these dogs. Like, it's like his goal to bring them to the pound, knowing that it's overcrowded and that they're going to have to kill some of them. Are people really that cruel? I mean, they are. Um, Very, very sad stories about people in Savannah even who are found with many dead animals on their lawn and being arrested recently so there are people that cruel but like why did I just feel like it's not that realistic for like animal control to be that cruel yeah I don't know but some people are people people just sometimes don't have feelings or something I don't know or they just want to take their anger out on something and they feel like it's better to take it out on an animal than a person it's like "Mm, maybe you should just get therapy because that'd probably help everyone you know (laughs) yeah or go to one of those like they have those like businesses now where you can like chuck axes at the wall do that if you want to be aggressive find a safe and healthy way to do it rip a pillow in half i don't care don't hit a living being or hurt them or like have ill will towards them for no reason true and i think with that that is actually everything we both have to say this time yeah all right (laughs) all right i'll run through Uh, social medias real quick yes our email is you talking to me podcast at gmail.com you can email us suggestions for future podcasts or themes coming up we do have a lot planned in the future but if we haven't recorded them yet we're willing to change if you want something else so keep that in mind people we also have an instagram at you talking to me dot podcast where you get sneak peeks of future month themes what movies we'll be watching you get to find out ahead of time so Keep an eye out on that and go follow there. Also, we've started doing live streams at the end of every month. We have the next one coming up in one week, I believe, from now. So keep an eye out for that and just go follow our Instagram to find out which film that will be. It wouldn't be one week because that would be Monday. So it's uh, on six Sunday. days. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's on, on Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> so the last Sunday of every month, we will be doing live podcasts on the you talking to me dot podcast g or um instagram as well as hannah's instagram we also have a twitter at you talking to me 11 because we're both number one go subscribe to our youtube channel hit the notification bell we are on video now as you've heard us say literally four million times now at this point because we want you to watch us <laughs> um I literally spend time making sure my shirts are different every week. Please don't make this a waste of my time. Um, with my, Because that's one of the many spreadsheets we have. So Hannah doesn't give a crap. I do for some reason. I believe that is all. So Hannah, do you want to take us out? I do give a crap about the podcast. I just don't care what I'm wearing because I just don't care. But with that, that has been our episode of the You Talking to Me podcast. And my name is Hannah. And I'm Rachel. And that is all. So goodbye. That was a weird outro. So (laughs) tell me why that was weird. But you know what? That's okay. It can end differently every time. (laughs) Hope you enjoy it. (laughs) Bye.